Good morning, everybody. I'm going to begin session two, um, which is on mobility and empire in the transatlantic world. And I want to thank the Corning Museum very much for all their work and organization, especially to Kit Maxwell and my fellow moderators and panelists. And just briefly, in acknowledgement of Indigenous Peoples Day on the 11th of October, I am here in San Antonio in Texas. And I want to acknowledge the Payaya, the people of the Yanawana and the Tap, Pilum Coahuiltecans, who are native to South Texas and Northeast Mexico region, and who live in occupied territory currently known as San Antonio. We also acknowledge the Kumokrudo nation, whose traditional territory we are living on. You are the past, present, and future caretakers and knowledge keepers of this land. And we acknowledge your traditional ways and honor your resistance and all that you do to care for our planet. So I want to briefly introduce my fellow panelists, Anna Lemeris, who is an art and antiques dealer and expert from the Netherlands, and she's going to be writing, um, talking today about a history of colonial exploitation as featured on Dutch ceremonial goblets. Dr. Hannah Young is a lecturer in 19th century British history at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. She will be uh, talking to us about glass and the Atlantic world with specific reference to Ralph Bernal, a collector and slave owner. Philippe Palbert is a PhD candidate at History of Art and, as uh, Kit mentioned earlier, runs the Materializing Race online seminar, and he's at Yale University. He'll be talking about La Belle Creole, identity, race, and the dressing table in the French Atlantic world, so we can already see connections being made here. And finally, we will have Dr. Alexi Baker, who's from the Division of History of Science and Technology at the Yale Peabody Museum. She will be speaking on empire, science, spectacle, glass instruments on the transatlantic stage. So Anna, would you like to begin with an overview of your talk? Thank you. Ah. Yes, um, I'm an art historian and with my family, I run an antique business in Amsterdam in the center of the city. And today, one of the reasons that Amsterdam is so famous is because it's such a free and extremely tolerant city. But in a minute, you will hear about another side of Amsterdam. We are here in this shop, we are specialized in glass and I focus on ceremonial goblets, engraved ceremonial goblets. I do research in the glasses that I sell, that we sell. I uh, study their meaning. I really want to understand each uh, goblet thoroughly and I place them in a larger context. Goblets with um, a specific uh, transatlantic or colonial context are extremely rare and mostly in museums. And when Kit told about his seminar, I thought and decided uh, to share these goblets with you. The subjects are so diverse that I decided for my lecture to use them as an illustration of Dutch colonialism now. I will highlight four goblets that show in several ways the unequal situation between the Dutch and the people that worked for them. I will focus on the West Indian Company and the Dutch colony of Suriname. Uh, the Dutch West Indian Company was responsible for the Dutch triangular trade. Here on the lower row uh, of this glass, uh, we see a coat of arms of the West Indian Company, um, a three-masted ship with the W for the name. Uh, this is a wheel engraving. Um, the glass engraver would hold the glass against a turning copper wheel uh, with some diamond powder and uh, water. And this would make the glass whitish and matte. Um, and he could also polish his engraving. And you can see that in the three crosses in the upper row, uh, these crosses are um, polished. And he did that with a wooden wheel. Um, this is the coat of arms of Amsterdam with the specific crown of the city, crown. And to the right, the lower row to, to the right, you see the coat of arms of the family van Aerten van Sommelsdijk. And these uh, three parties together were the governors of the colony of Suriname. That's uh, quite unbelievable. And they were like the owners of the colony. In the middle, in the upper, uh, in the uh, middle of the lower row, you see uh, an indigenous man, and uh, there was an agreement between the Dutch and the indigenous people of uh, Suriname that these people were not uh, going to be enslaved. 
The coat of arms is also held by two indigenous men. You can only see their hands and arrows. Um, may I have the next slide? Uh, Amsterdam played an important role in both the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West Indian Company. And this is depicted by this goblet. Uh, this is a stipple engraving. In this technique, you have a diamond mounted in a pencil and the engraver would place a dot on the goblet. And where he put many dots, um, the goblet lightens up. And where there are lesser dots, uh, there comes a kind of shade. And in this way, you can vary endlessly in light and dark. So then you can make a very detailed engraving and also make a lot of death. And this incredible technique was only used in the Netherlands in the 18th century. And this goblet is attributed to David Wolf. We see a personification of the city of Amsterdam. You recognize the coat of arms of her, on her chest. She's wearing the crown and on her lap is a Bible. In her left hand, she has a lance with on it a hat. And this is the hat of freedom. Uh, it's a symbol, a typical Dutch symbol of freedom mm -hmm. after a long period of suppression. The Dutch were suppressed by the Spanish, the family of Habsburg, and they freed themselves. And from the 16th century until the 18th, this is a very important symbol. And to the left, we see uh, Asia with a hoard of plenty filled with pearls. And to the right, a personification of Africa, um, of a man who is donating uh, an elephant tusk. Today, this engraving is very confusing because, of course, these treasures were not given, but taken by Amsterdam. Um, may I have the next slide? Um, here we see the same technique, and the horse uh, appears black to us because um, um, the, it's in the reverse technique, and the background is very much uh, stippled. You see a lot of stipples in the background. Um, this galloping horse is another symbol of uh, freedom after a long period of suppression in the Netherlands. Um, also, this developed in the 16th century and stayed uh, actual until the end of the 18th century. The goblet is signed by Franz Greenwood. He was a Dutch man, a child of two uh, English parents. Um, he developed this technique in the 18th century and he inspired many people to um, work in this technique as well. At a certain moment, uh, Greenwood inherited a part of a large plantation in Suriname. However, he never was in that colony. Greenwood did not have to work, he had enough money, and he could spend all his time studying art with his friends in the St. Luke Brotherhood of the city of Dordrecht, writing poems. He was a very famous poet at the time in the Netherlands and engraving these incredible scenes. There are still some goblets depicting Suriname plantations. Like Greenwood, many other plantation owners of plantations in Suriname lived in the Netherlands. They drank, they drank to the success of their plantation here in the Lao countries. And these engraved goblets probably never left the country at that time. And the next slide um, shows one of the, um, these goblets, goblets that we still know. It's a beautiful example of a goblet with a Suriname plantation. It is engraved by Jacob Sang, the most famous engraver of the Netherlands. He lived in Amsterdam and engraved several Suriname plantations on glass. So not only people that were directly involved with the Dutch and, uh, and um, the Dutch East Indian Company and the West Indian Company took advantage of the equal situation of the colonies. Also people like engravers gained from it. On the goblet, uh, it's a very complex scene. We see houses, um, coffee trees, uh, the jungle in the distance, uh, a meadow with, a, with cows in it. But in the foreground, we see a man only wearing a loincloth. Uh, and he's working, he's forced to work in a barn. In the middle of the engraving, we see a strange building. And when we take a closer look, it appears to be a bell hanging in the building. And I only recognize this because of the impressive exhibition about slavery in the Rijksmuseum of Amsterdam um, this uh, summer that started with a row of bells. 
of these bells. It appears that these bells were used to dictate the day, the lives of the people that were forced to work on the plantations. Also today, for descendants of these people, these bells still are a very negative symbol. They are even called slave bells in Dutch, slaven bell. So the goblet and the engraving look wonderful. Nevertheless, there is maybe unintentionally a powerful symbol of oppression engraved on the glass. The goblets that I found show that the Dutch drank to the success of the East Indian Company and the West Indian Company in several ways, and that they openly depicted the way how they suppressed other people. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Anna, for such a coherent and really fascinating overview of your talk. Um, really important history to bring out. Um, we'll move on now to Hannah Young, whose talk will clearly tie in with this as well. Um, yeah, th hello everyone uh, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to very briefly uh, talk uh, about the subject uh, of my talk, um, who um, is Ralph Bernal. Um, Bernal was one of the most celebrated collectors in 19th century Britain. Um, he collected a huge range, uh, well over 4,000 items, um, of what he called curious objects, um, including ceramics, metalwork, furniture, and of course, glass. When he died in 1854, his obituary in the Times declared that, quote, in matter of art and taste, Mr. Bernal's judgment was justly esteemed as one of the best in England. Uh, and Bernal's distinction as a collector very much continues to characterize his posthumous reputation pretty much to this day, um, with Arthur McGregor, James Stourton, and John Whiteley among um, the sort of many who have praised Bernal's collection and in particular highlighted the significance um, of his collecting um, in the sort of development of a field of collecting, particularly associated with decorative arts. Bernal, though, uh, as is probably obvious, um, wasn't just a collector. He also owned three Jamaican estates and enslaved over 550 men, women and children. As far as I'm aware, he never went to Jamaica, but this, his um, enslavement of other um, human beings absolutely infused his, his collecting in lots and lots of ways. My work then aims to use Bernal as um, a way to interrogate how enslavement, race, culture and taste were entwined in 19th century Britain. Um, I believe that we shouldn't sort of uncritically celebrate the connoisseur, as people very often still do, without interrogating the power relations that shaped how their collections and their reputations were constructed. We can't understand Bernal or the perfection of his taste as it was known without acknowledging the violence that is absolutely embedded within it. Um, and I don't know if others can see, I can't see the presentation, um, but my first slide, there we are, it is um, an image um, taken from uh, an installation of art, um, um, poetry and photography um, by the fantastic poet and artist Victoria Adequi Bully, um, which was very much a, a response to this research. How do we get at these histories within these decorative arts collections? Um, in the image that Victoria is holding is a memento mori that was in Bernal's collection. Um, and I know it's not glass, but um, these images I find so powerful that I, I really wanted to, to show them. The links between Bernal's slave ownership and his collecting practices were very direct. He began collecting shortly after he inherited his Jamaican property um, in the early 19th century. This it then escalated significantly in the mid 1830s, shortly after he received the £11,460 from the British government, and that's in 19th century money, that is millions today. Um, that was part of the £20 million compensation the government awarded to slave owners, um, without which emancipation um, would certainly not have occurred. 
Um, on the next slide are a, a couple of um, pieces of glassware that really exemplify the glassware within Bernal's collection as a whole. Um, he particularly collected uh, Venetian glass, sort of 16th and 17th Venetian glass. Um, indeed, I believe that his um, he really sort of um, revitalized the, um, the collection of Venetian glass in, in Britain. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, we've got sort of German uh, 17th, 18th century glass. I am, I'm not sure I should admit this, absolutely not an expert in glass in any way, shape or form, um, um, but uh, for which I apologize. Um, uh, and I'm sure if yeah, people want to sort of know more about these, these Sort of glass collecting in this period i'd love to know more um but I, yeah they were sort of these scenes as high point of european glass making that that i do know it's hugely significant that as someone who was primarily interested in um object dar um bernal's collection was primarily constituted of european objects and um what he termed, quote, oriental treasures. This is very different from other slave owning collectors, most obviously um, Hans Sloan, we might also think of George Hibbert, who are collecting much more, I think, consciously collecting items that are linked with the Caribbean and enslavement. That is not what Bernal is doing at all. But nevertheless, the collections of these sort of um, objects are certainly work to reinforce racial ideas racialized ideas about antiquity and civilization as associated with Eurasia and not the Americas or perhaps Egypt accepted Africa. The objects in Bernal's collection were considered decorative arts worthy of esteem in a way that those from the African and American continents weren't. This, I mean, it's all sort of a fairly obvious point, but it reminds us that at the heart of the process of constructing taste in, in the 19th century in particular, were racialized and indeed racist ideas about culture and civilization. Bernal's prodigious collecting was part of a process of self-fashioning, enabling himself to construct an identity um, as a sort of refined and tasteful gentleman that was far removed from the distant reaches of the plantation societies of the Caribbean, whilst nevertheless continuing to profit from them. He didn't try and hide what he was doing. Um, he's not denying it, but I think this becoming a sort of a gentleman of taste is really significant um, to his sense of self. Through his collecting then, Bernal worked to fortify and remake racial hierarchies. That is as much a part of the significance of these objects as their materiality or their aesthetic si significance. But it is one that continues to be obscured in biographies, um, as uh, are seen on the next slide, um, um, which is what I would just like to leave you with, which I'm sure very unconsciously, um, but only work to reproduce the very strategies utilised by 19th century slave owners um, themselves. And I will leave it at that. Thank you. Um, though, yeah, if, if you could, if you were willing to leave up the um, slide for just a couple of seconds to give chance, people a chance to read it, um, I just want to particularly draw attention to the final sentence, um, which is when after a sort of this a relatively detailed description of Bernal's education um, and sort of uh, collecting, and then there's this final half a sentence, which says his fortune derived from estates in the West Indies, um, which, yeah. Is, Thank you, Hannah. Uh, that's certainly a pattern that's re uh, of, yeah, that's repeated on plaques. I'm thinking of John Newton, the enslaver and evangelical, and you know they have to bracket off <laughs> that he had been a slave trader as well. So it's it's an interesting pattern of how we publicly uh, remember these figures. Okay, let's move on to uh, Philippe Palbert. Great. Well, thank you, Carrie. Can everyone hear me? Great. And then. Uh, I'll just give the slides a second to show up. Great, super. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, Hannah, that was a great segue taking a biographical lens. That's sort of my, my style as well in terms of recovering the lives, the experiences of people, some for whom we don't necessarily have any full length standard kinds of bio, uh, biographical studies. Um, 
the paper that I presented uh, a snapshot of is sort of a, it's a, a cross section of things and themes from my dissertation, which is a work in progress at the moment. So I appreciate you uh, working through these things with me as I learn about them myself. Um, but this is a project in which I consider um, performative of dimensions of Creole identity, um, subjectivity, self-fashioning, and uh, through the lens specifically of lived colonial experiences. So shifting the setting uh, from the normal European setting to that of, of the new world, um, as it were. Um, and uh, having said that, though, I start with this image at right, which I find to be a very compelling image, a European image by European artists for a European audience for the most part. Um, rather than dismiss this image out of hand, however, I use it as a kind of uh, springboard from which to jump into this, this very question of mirrors in French colonial America. Uh, what were they? Who had them? Uh, what were they used for? Is there any sense of value, uh, whether monetary or symbolic or cultural? And uh, how is this all bound up in larger questions of uh, race, which I use in quotes, um, uh, representation, rank, um, and identity in, uh, in a French colonial context? So starting with this image from this mid 1760s uh, treatise on, on race in which the author is really concerned with understanding the origin of blackness, which up until then had been considered uh, very, very quickly uh, uh, a marker of sin, uh, a marker of uh, bile, blood in excess, so a kind of imbalanced humor. Um, but this French surgeon, Nicolas Claude, Nicolas Lecat, is interested in finding the origin of blackness vis-a-vis -vis whiteness, which he attributes to uh, a membrane uh, in the skin and a sort of a special fluid that uh, African bodies produce ostensibly. It's completely debunked and totally pseudoscientific, but he was trying to take things to a scientific level. What interests me, however, in this image is that mirror that is mediating the scene and, and here held up by an enslaved African man on this colonial plantation in some sort of unknown exotic locale in, in the Americas, but groups together the European, the African, and the Native American. Um, could you do the next slide? Great, thanks. So in terms of thinking about um, in this paper and in my work in general, thinking about how the mirror, how these kinds of objects linked to self-presentation, how they filter through and inform uh, the discourse around the objects themselves and around uh, empire, race, and identity, thinking about the transaction, um, the object itinerary, as I heard in the last panel, of these small hand mirrors, which are um, not the most expensive thing you can get. This is not like a full length, five foot tall Trumeau mirror, um, but it's still a little, a little luxury. And for native peoples of the Americas who uh, might have in some places polished obsidian, they might have some other polished stone and water in which to contemplate their own reflections. This is a really uh, revolutionary thing. And to the point that mirrors are consistently included in gifts, in diplomatic uh, gifts and presents and uh, to, to trade for furs and other kinds of uh, raw materials and, and goods that Europeans are looking to send back to, to Europe and, and use in trade in the colonies. Um, but we have a very fragmentary record, but it is a record nonetheless that survives both in the visual uh, culture of the period and then archaeologically these small hand mirrors that were found in what is now southern Alabama. Uh, next slide. So uh, in terms of the next um, next kind of part of the talk, I, I, I look and again use this engraving as a way to channel tap into a, a real life and that is the life of this French colonial woman Françoise Gallard, who's born in what's now Alabama, not far from where those mirrors were found, um, and lived up and down the Mississippi, dying in New Orleans, where she ended up spending most of her life when all was said and done. But uh, this is, is part of my mission to recover this actual colonial settlement. What was it actually like to live there? We don't think of New Orleans necessarily before, uh, as a place necessarily before the 19th century and the Anglo-American period. And yet here in 1738, only 20 years after New Orleans was found, we have this Creole colonial born woman who owns this lavish dressing set in black lacquer, a matched set um, that is given a relatively high value and centered around 
what but a mirror. Um, but Gadar herself is uh, also a slave owner. And this is such a small value compared to the worth of the human beings, men, women, and children that she was enslaving at the same time that she owned and used these objects. And so to kind of interrogate these now lost items, these are all contemporary examples that I offer as a kind of point of comparison. But what can we learn about makeup? What can we learn about uh, self-presentation? And how does that play into larger larger discourse and debate on, on race, as it were, uh, the stakes of which I think were a little different in a place like New Orleans, where uh, the population is different, the climate is different. Um, and, and I didn't include it in the talk, but there's some really interesting comments from French visitors to Saint-Domingue, to Haiti, about women using makeup that is melt, it's melting off their faces, um, but they're still doing it anyway. And so why? Um, you know, it's 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 all bound up in these rituals and these kinds of concerns and preoccupations and priorities over uh, keeping and making up appearances, looking, dressing the part. Um, I think I have one more slide. Yeah. And so just to, to end things, so I, I use this image uh, often to kind of reinforce to to communicate these themes, this Martinique painting, uh, which could have been painted in Haiti as much as it could have been painted in Louisiana, but it was painted uh, in, in Martinique where this gentleman was a colonial official. And here we see in a very similar way almost uh, anchoring the scene uh, like in the engraving from the the, the frontispiece rather, uh, a dressing mirror. And it's the, the woman who is appearing twice frontally and in profile seated at her dressing mirror. So this is all bound up in a much larger, um, a much larger culture of, of consumption and representation. Um, and just, yeah, just because I see it in the chat. So Creole, I use it in the most general term as it would have been in the 18th century to denote, to identify someone born in one of the colonies who is not uh, indigenous. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with race in this period. It is really just the most basic catch-all for something born in the new world who, that is not native to the Americas. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to your questions and thanks for your time and, and attention. Thank you so much, Philippe. And yes, these patterns that we're seeing, uh, repeat, repeated um, visual stagings are, are so interesting. And I think when we hear uh, Dr. Baker's talk, we're gonna get a really sort of completed sense of the kinds of uh, materials, uh, the materiality of glass and the uses to which glass was put in the Atlantic world. So, Alexi. Thank you. Can I have the first slide, please? Thank you. Um, so thank you again, Carrie and Kit and the entire very impressive team at Corning. I'm speaking briefly today about instruments when the, within the British and the American early modern context. And these are not musical instruments. These are not surgical instruments. They're what people today often call scientific instruments. However, in their time, these instruments were not scientific. As you can see briefly explained on this slide, they were most commonly called optical or mathematical or philosophical. Science as we know developed more recently and these instruments outfitted all different kinds of activities and interests, not just what we think of as science. They facilitated practical everyday pursuits and the affectations and the entertainments of the middling sort and the wealthy as much as they did research and observation. Optical instruments were of course, most obviously associated with glass but there were glass components in all types of these technologies. In Britain, local instrument makers met most of the demand for these goods. London was the single largest center of instrument making and selling in Europe for perhaps 250 years. It was supplying much of the world and not just Britain. In contrast, America, both before and after the revolution, had to import many technologies from Britain. Next slide, please. Yes, the video is going. So this was especially true for the instruments that involved glass because early America did not commercially produce its own scientific and optical quality glass. And in this video, you can see Yale's very first microscope, which was brought back from London along with other in instruments in 1734. It was purchased from Edward Scarlett, but it was probably made by Matthew Loft. And this was in fact, the college's only microscope for many decades, which in part tells you how valuable these instruments were and how tricky and expensive it was often to acquire them from Britain. 
My pre-recorded talk went into a lot more detail about the making and selling of instruments like these and about all of the different ways that glass could be incorporated into them. So I would suggest jumping over there to get a lot more of that detail. Today, I'd like to delve further into the connections between early modern instruments and imperialism, colonialism, and their human impacts. There were, of course, also sometimes environmental impacts, but we don't really have time to dive into that as well. So first of all, instruments were connected to these things in the most general sense. They were pervasive in many different aspects of life in the British Empire and early America, both as material objects and as symbols. However, in addition to this, instruments and their components and their raw materials, including glass, were also trade goods. They flowed along a number of transatlantic and global trade networks. And as a result, they helped to underpin major commercial interests like the trading companies, as we've heard about in some of the other talks. And some of these institutions and trade routes had ties to the forced movement and labor of people, as well as to other varied interactions with indigenous populations, which could be disruptive or destructive. Next slide, please. There were certain types of instruments which also related more directly to the institutions and dynamics of imperialism and oppression. Examples include those used in navigation, surveying, and naval and military maneuvers. And you can see in this video an octant that was made by Gilbert and Company of London in either the late 1700s or the early 1800s. And there is an advertisement inside its wooden box, as you can see at one point, for Samuel Browning of Boston, who imported instruments from the British capital. Octants like this were used in the interrelated celestial practices of navigation, surveying, and timekeeping. Lewis and Clark used a very similar instrument in the early 1800s on their well-known expedition through the Western lands, which America acquired in the Louisiana Purchase. And like so many expeditions at this time, this journey combined national territorial and commercial interests, scientific research, and varying interactions with indigenous Native American populations. William Clark also brought an enslaved black man named York on the expedition. And even though he was an active and an important member of the team, Clark continued to treat him horrifically after the expedition. And according to what account you believe, either he never freed him or he freed him much later, many years later. Occasionally strongly imperialist institutions and activities, such as these national expeditions, also spawn specific inventions. And one example of this is the sextant, which was developed and tested in association with the Board of Longitude, which is called in a simple form, <laughs> the first science and technology funding body in Britain. The board contributed to a number of well-known voyages, including those of Captain Cook in the Pacific, and it was deeply involved in related technological innovations, most famously today, the marine chronometer. Next slide, please. The instrumental activities, which would today be thought of as science, including research, observation, and teaching, were often specifically tied to slavery, as well as to varied European interactions of other kinds with indigenous cultures. So for example, on expeditions, sometimes enslaved black people were involved in collecting natural specimens and in caring for apparatus. Indigenous people were also involved in these activities in ways which often drew upon their local knowledge. And these relationships ran the gamut from paid work or willing collaboration, such as in the case of Tupaia in the Pacific, to under-rewarded and coerced participation, which could include both kidnapping through kidnapping and slavery. Early modern science also benefited from slavery in less visible ways, especially in America. The money, supplies, and interpersonal connections which went into enabling scientific research and teaching often overlapped with those of British and American slave-owning society. And this could be true even for scientific practitioners who were not only not engaged in slavery themselves, but who were abolitionists. Slavery was structural, it was systemic in this early modern context. So very few instruments of glass were inherently prejudiced or destructive, nor were most solely used in blatantly imperialist and oppressive activities, but they were an integral part of these societies and these institutions and thus of their enduring impacts. And I think you've heard these themes as well in the other talks. So I'm really looking forward to our discussion, bringing all these things together. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you all so much. And we've got about 20 minutes now for some discussion. Um, and I mean, yes, there's literally, there's so much to discuss. <laughs> um, I have one question here that came in from a participant, Erin. Um, and this is a comment and question for um, uh, Alexi Baker and, and Philippe. Um, in the engraving of John Cogg's instruments that we've seen in Dr. Baker's lecture, uh, it, stru it struck her that the shape of the border of the frame resembles the form of the dressing table and glasses and handheld mirrors considered by Halbert. So this idea of mirrors within mirrors and frames. So is it fitting that the instrument maker Cogs finds a looking glass, an appropriate visual trope to reflect his wares in his advertisement? This is based on your whole talk, Philippe. Um, I think you know, this participant watched both of the full presentations. And given the relationship between the pursuit of knowledge and discovery in the era of the Enlightenment and the use of mirrors to reflect and enhance or alter one's status. So I wonder what the, that connection between um, the pursuit of knowledge and the trope of the mirror almost as a reflection of how knowledge is being made within other images. I don't know if either of you would like to comment on that. I'm okay going first, but if you want to jump in, Philippe, it's up to you. Okay, I'll go. I'll go Either ahead. way. <laughs> Thanks for the question, yeah. So there's sort of two ways I would answer this. And first there's the more sort of symbolic answer that glass instruments and other glass implements, as you're referring to, were very much involved in <clears throat> metaphorically speaking about insight, about revealing things through nature, about all these sorts of things. You see not just, for example, things being framed like looking glasses, but satirical cartoons and other sorts of visual representations being framed within a microscope or a telescope as if you were looking through those instruments as well to discover the truth. So there is that symbolic answer to this. But I think also when you're sometimes seeing very similar aesthetic approaches to instruments like in the advertisements and to other sorts of things. It is also reflecting how all different crafts were very interrelated at this period. Instrument making was strongly interrelated with furniture making and the making of other wooden implements with um, the making of printed and other engraved materials with of course many different glass types of wares. And so there's also just that sort of more practical aspect that people, even within the instrument trade, are thinking in terms of all these other interrelated crafts and the way that they present things as well. So I think you could look at it from either angle and I will stop babbling. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's that's really well put and I don't have all that much more to add to it because it's, it's, it's very well synthesized there. Um, I, I like the way, I think it was in the question, the, the pursuit of knowledge, knowledge and discovery. Um, and in terms of thinking about, about just kind of the revolutionary nature of mirrors, even a little small thing that you can hold yourself, knowledge of the self and truth, what do you really look like? Uh, because if you're relying on uh, someone else to tell you, well, maybe they're they just want to make you feel better that day. Um, if you have the power to look and contemplate and consider uh, your plan of attack when you're going to sit before a mirror, whether a large dressing mirror or a small piece, um, that that gives you that empowers you to a certain extent to do whatever it is you want to do to your face uh, the way that you'd like to do it. And and so I think there's something there with with knowledge of the self. Um, I, I work a lot with portraiture, and so in, by the 18th century, there's a much um, a much larger discourse on accuracy, on likeness, likeness itself, you know, how like is the image, is the portrait, the static image that someone else is making of you, uh, and not with the assistance of any kind of mechanized camera-like apparatus. Uh, so we're, we're still in the 18th century here, and there is a that there's room, there's a margin of error, perhaps, but to think of the mirror itself, which is a technological innovation, uh, a wonder even uh, for some people, and not just Native American people. I mean, you have references of people going to court at Versailles and being completely blown away by the mirrors, by the profusion of glass, uh, when they maybe have either a very small piece at home or nothing at all, and, and that's in metropolitan Europe, so yeah. It's so fascinating what you're both saying. And, and just to make a meta comment, I, I think it really shows how this kind of work requires multidisciplinary perspectives, because as Alexi and, and Philippe says, all these techniques, you know, the, the objects in themselves are thinking of other things that, in themselves, so to speak. Um, I have a question for, for Anna as well. And I was very much struck by, by what um, Anna's drawn out, that, that technique of engraving on glass. And, um, and it's just so fascinating that you 
tell us that these are techniques that are specific to the Netherlands and you've talked about the stippling. I wonder if you wanted to say a little bit more about those specific, I think for the, the glass experts in the audience, those specific techniques of, of um, working with glass that are specific to the Netherlands in this period. And yes, specific for the Netherlands is the stipple engraving technique. The um, wheel engraving technique is uh, developed in what we now call Germany. And there were many German engravers that came to the Netherlands to work here, uh, like Jakob Sang, who lived in Amsterdam. Um, but the stipple engraving is something that uh, was first seen, is first seen, seen on silver in the 17th century. And then in that century, there was a famous woman, um, Anna Rumer Visser, who uh, stippled one cherry on a glass. She engraved many glasses and is world famous for that. And there is this one uh, ch um, stippled cherry um, in the Rijksmuseum. Um, then in the 18th century, Franz Greenwood uh, started engraving first with a diamond. Um, but then diamond line technique, and then you draw lines, but then the problem is that what you draw lightens up. This when, so that's, you have the, um, the inclination to make a negative of what you really want to draw. Because when normally when you draw, you draw with black. Um, and from this, he developed this stipple engraving uh, technique thoroughly, and you can make um, it very much alive, just like a photograph. It's, uh, it's, it's nearly the same as a photograph. When you're good, when you can draw very well, you can make the most um, yeah, fascinating engravings in this technique. That's so interesting, you. It makes me think of um, William Blake, the, the engraver, his, his um, relief etching technique that was exactly that reverse making that he really developed um, and as an artisan himself. And it makes me think of, of that. Um, exact reverse practice. Thank you so much for, for saying more about that. Um, and Hannah, um, if we just move on to, to you a little bit more, um, you know, the, the collection, what's so interesting is that Anna's shown us a, a whole range of these glasses that, you know, celebrate and, and note slavery and celebrate it down to showing us a plantation. But you've talked about how Bernal really excluded objects that uh, tied him to the Caribbean, which is which is very interesting. But but collected co pieces that are arguably made his whiteness or made his identity as a man of taste. Um, so I just wonder if you could reflect a little bit more on uh, this making of the connoisseur. I'm thinking of David Hume's work, the philosopher on standards of taste, and and how you know, and, and of course Hume has that part where he is very clear about white men are the, the standard bearers of this day. So I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about these skills and tastes are inherent in this strand of material culture and not just intertwined with it, not just sort of accidental, um, but in, intertwined with it, in that collecting. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really clear that evaluating acquiring and consuming art is a really important means um i think for often uh, absentees which again is interesting those who are living in in the metropole um uh, that are working to reproduce racialized hierarchies um it's you make me think of uh, an image, um, a painting that people might know called the Patrons and Lovers of Art, um, which is painted in 1830 to commemorate um, the founding of the National Gallery and the significance of ind individual collectors in that. Um, and it is um, of about the sort of, I think there were seven or eight, possibly nine individual individuals depicted in this painting um, and about half of them don't quote me on that um, uh, Zoe Thomas has done some work on this have links direct links with enslavement it's fairly clear that that it's really this what was seen as this um, skill in making aesthetic judgments I mean there's lots that's going on there um, but part of what that's doing is is separating them from the people they enslaved and it is also separating them from this idea of the West Indian as a sort of overly extravagant um, 
you know, reprobate type figure, which is, you know, very common in the um, late uh, 18th century. Um, they are, I think, con working to construct a vision of themselves as metropolitan men, um, which is key. Yeah, I, th I think what you're saying also ties very much to that, that what, what, what Kit gave us an overview of earlier, this, the polite and the polished, that deliberate construction of that identity. Um, Yes, uh, I think there's a couple of questions here that I'll take from the audience to give people a chance to feed in. And one from, from Betty here, was there a tradition, I think this is for you, Anna, was there a tradition of the Jewish engravers being in the Netherlands because the name Jacob Sam makes her wonder? Um, yes, the, <clears throat> it's um, Jacob, so it's a B at the end. Uh, but in the 19th century, there were there was one, uh, Jewish engraver, Henriquez de Castro. So, but the, I think, um, I don't know of others being um, Jewish. It's so interesting. Um, and we, you know, we'll note these down as things, things we have to maybe do more further, further work on as we keep going. And I have a really lovely comment here from Anne Smart Martin, um, which probably is for, for, for Philippe, but also possibly for Alexi. And uh, you see what you think. This discussion of mirrors, um, Anne, Anne has found uh, interesting connections between enslaved people and the purchase of small mirrors in British Jewish in Virginia. So do you think there's a parallel in French trade in the New Orleans, or is there a connection between your evidence about uh, native um, peoples and their use and meaning of mirrors. And we've talked a little bit about this. And actually I was um, thinking of the, um, the, the myth of the sky, the sky woman um, and, and ways in which light and reflectivity are embedded in, in indigenous creative myths is also maybe something we want to think about as we're thinking of the reception of these, these kinds of mirrors. Yeah, and, and I love that piece by, by Anne Smart Martin. Uh, in, in her book specifically in that enslaved woman's relationship to small mirrors. I always think about that essay when I go to uh, an historic site in Virginia and see a little mirror. There's at Stratford Hall, there's a little mirror hanging in one of the reconstructed uh, quarter buildings. And I always think of, of that piece. Um, it's a really good question. And it really, um, I think, sheds light, illuminates the fact that this is really hard work to do without more consistent um, and or existent even sources. Um, and so that's where things like archaeology can come into play, um, I think, specifically with respect to native peoples of the Mississippi Valley. Um, on the one hand, we have uh, French and French colonial accounts of native people being buried with mirrors and a small pot of vermilion so that they can paint themselves in the afterlife. Now, how well that particular gentleman understood indigenous ideas with respect to an afterlife is unclear. Um, but we do know that um, archaeologically anyway, mirrors, small hand mirrors have been found um, at, at burial sites. There's a very famous one in Louisiana that was um, not really excavated, but really just looted in uh, the 20th century. But since then, all the objects were restituted to the tribe in question, the Tunica of Biloxi, um, who have made a really fantastic museum and exhibition around that discovery of, of these, these burial goods. And so it's a, a huge cross section of ceramics and uh, glass and some small mirrors, and even I think a little fragment of a vermilion, a piece of unground vermilion and other tools and, and objects. Um, and so that's that's not necessarily, however, reflecting right um, any specific indigenous value uh, of the mirrors, but uh, beyond the fact that it was buried right with the other objects that uh, are used in that kind of painting the body uh, for looking viewing the self the, the self. Um, and in terms of uh, African people, it's it's a question that I, I wish I had a better answer for, but I. Um, I, I am kind of interested in considering the extent to which those people are manipulating, wielding the mirrors that then their enslavers are using. And so that kind of, it brings everyone into the same, the same space and interacting with and around the same kinds of objects, so. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I, I mean, one thing I'll just put out there, but based on a little bit of reading I've done because of your papers, is just the gendering of light um, in, in, in Native American mythologies and in some Western African Wolof traditions, that light is, is, is comes from a mother figure. Uh, whereas we can see in the Enlightenment, the idea of um, 
be liked and 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 seeing and looking um, as a, a way of building knowledge. The kind of instruments that Alexi talking about is really uh, gendered as masculine, but then the mirror and vanity are gendered as, as feminine. So we can maybe think about gendering there. And yeah. I, yeah. It's it's a good point. I mean, I'm, I'm, in terms of in terms of thinking now about my my sources, uh, you know, it's a lot of European and Euro colonial sources. And one of the things, one of the the ongoing tropes is how it's usually native men who are always carrying a mirror with them on their person. They're sometimes wearing them around their necks. You know, they've been pierced or strung onto some kind of necklace. Um, and so there is a really interesting gendered component there too, which I think is probably bound up in um, casting these indigenous societies as you know, sure, uncivilized, unrefined, um, but also the men themselves are supposedly effeminate. They're not really men. They're they're concerned with painting themselves, just like European, and in this case, European Euro-colonial woman is as well. And so there's a way to kind of justify perhaps um, colonialism in an empire because these people are they're not sophisticated and they are uh, engaged in more frivolous pursuits. But then again, makeup and the dressing table is bound up in this much larger culture of, you know, courtly precedent as well. Um, but yeah. Yeah, wonderful. And and I'm going to bring um, uh, Alexi back in here um, because, you know, your, your focus is very much on the science, the burgeoning, I know science hasn't come into being yet, but the sort of emergent, uh, what we come to call scientific uses of glass. Um, I wonder with you and Anna as in particular commenting on any sort of links or correlations or differences between a sort of more industrialized or utilitarian uh, use of and production of glass and the more aesthetic. I mean, I know it's not an easy separation or boundary to make, but it seems like the Atlantic world or the, if we're thinking of the Atlantic is a sort of space for proliferating different ways in which glass can be thought off in terms of its uses and I just want, that's a bigger comment just for you. Well I think the biggest difference between what we're looking at myself and Anna is that with Anna's goblets the glass itself is part of the aesthetic fashion related etc aspect and not just the utilitarian whereas in the instruments I can't even think of an instance where the glass was part of the appearance and the part of how these objects were also definitely related to fashion, aesthetics, less utilitarian purposes. It was always the other materials like shagreen and inset mother of pearl and imported woods and so on that played into that aspect. Whereas the glass was the, you know, it, was, it could be expensive. So that reflects an aspect of fashion and display, but the glass itself was the functional part of the instrument. So I, to me, that's the biggest difference, but otherwise we're looking at similar contexts a fashion display use, et cetera. <laughs> I think that's so, so fascinating though. Um, I know in, in, in Sparking Company in the book, and um, maybe somebody can remind me of the name of the painting though, the glass instruments, the, the telescope and be, become painted in drawing rooms that are, then become woven. That's where they become woven into the aesthetic making of, of you know, that what Tam is talking about, the taste and the politeness. So when they're taking off off, off board of the, where they're being used. Um, and I have a little comment here from a, a, a person in the audience. Could you talk a little bit more about the optical effects of engraved glass when filled with liquid contents? Can we consider the engraving as more than just an image, but also a theatrical performance? Yes, exactly. We, um, when we first came into this shop, we thought that uh, an engraving uh, was very good visible when you would pour red wine in the glass uh, because of this whitish effect of the engraving uh, and since these goblets are so rare and valuable we never poured wine in it but uh, when we one day uh, really did then it appeared that you need white wine for these goblets and that the white wine um, works in different ways uh, very much a theater theater theatrical effect um, because it, it's, it works like a magnifying glass uh, the wine itself. So when you look through the wine to the engraving, um, it, it's like a miracle. And um, so it magnifies, but it is also moving. And of course, a glass is always three-dimensional. You don't realize it when you see these pictures. But when you pour wine in a glass, this effect is enormous. So you can really see that, that uh, especially the Dutch goblets are made for wine because there are always some uh, parts or in the engraving where you can look through. So it's never an engraving around the entire 
the goblet. You can always look through the wine to the other, uh, other side of the goblet. Um, and of course, this has to do with light because there was no light and you could really catch the light with the white wine and the lead glass, uh, these candle lights. So they're, and they were extremely um, expensive at the time. So they were probably also made to, to show uh, how rich you were. Thank you so much. Um, and I, um, I see Rebecca Shroom is in the audience too. And we, we were talking about your book um, uh, a lot uh, in, our, in our conversation um, and, and thinking about how, how the making of the self is woven into to mirrors and reflexivity. But I have a question here from um, Anne Stewart for Hannah about Bernal's collection. Uh, what happened to it after its death? What, his death was it dispersed and and this might link to also you know if you wanted to, when you're answering that thinking about how collections and museums note these relationships and and what your what place your work has and where these objects are now to be found and how we're asking these public spaces to think of and, and mark them uh, i think you know we noted the, the plaque for example as, as a sort of hiding of, of his uh, true work Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was indeed uh, dispersed upon uh, just after his death in, in a big, big sale at, at Christie's. Um, but um, Henry Cole did try um, and persuade the museum, um, to persuade the British government um, to buy it in its entirety. Um, so uh, I, I'm actually not sure Bernal was that bothered about sort of keeping it for posterity, but there was absolutely a recognition that this, this is, you know, mid 19th century, absolutely bound up with the development of 19th century art, particularly art museums. Um, so um, Cole tried very, very hard to, to, for, to get the money to buy the entire collection. The government refused, but gave them some money um, to the British Museum and to, um, what is now the VNA? Um, so large uh, portion of it ended up in the early South Kensington Museum. It played a really, really important part. Um, it's one of the sort of foundational collections of, of the South Kensington Museum, um, which leads me to sort of Kerry's question about. Um, and I mean, this history, the sort of you've. It's not that it is. Um, erased as such as as that you know um i think document from the contemporary um bna indicates because people have basically all, always known this Bernal never tried to hide what he was doing um but it's um it's i think this what Anne laura stoll has called aphasia it's the the knowing and not knowing the the unwillingness to really engage what that actually um, involved. Um, and I think arguably, yeah, it, we're in a cultural moment, I think both in the Britain and the US and indeed elsewhere, um, where museums, and I, I wonder whether art museums in particular are have because of these sort of disciplinary silos that have shaped them. Um, I'm afraid we're, we're getting lots yeah, of it. Sorry. Thank you so much, no, Hannah. There's so much. I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is, I think we could go on for another long while, but we have to leave now. Alexis put a wonderful link there for people who'd like to more about this technological making of the glass instruments. Thank you all for an amazing panel. It's just, you know, given us all so much to think about and uh, carry on with, with the rest of the day. See you later. Bye bye. <laughs>